And here we are now moving into Unit 5 Fiber Evidence. We'll see that fiber evidence has some similar uh, analyses like light microscopy that we talked about with hair. So it's a logical follow-up to our previous unit. So uh, let's go ahead and look at fibers. Now while hair could be individualized evidence, we'll see that fiber evidence is typically class evidence. It's a common, highly available uh, type of material with garments made in bulk around the world. So uh, we tend not to have individualized evidence. Uh, and again, with hair, we didn't either unless we really had that follicular tag uh, and then we could get DNA from it that would individualize the evidence. But here with fibers, we tend to look at class evidence. And again, which is not unimportant evidence, but it tends not to be as valuable in most cases as the individualized evidence. So let's go ahead and define our terms. So a fiber is a small, thin piece of string with the length bigger than the diameter so it's longer than it is wide uh, and that's our typical fiber yarn is actually a collection of fibers twisted together and then a textile or a fabric is a collection of yarn weaved together and so that's what we tend to deal in is the textiles or fabrics uh, but they're composed of yarns which are composed of fibers so that's why we call this chapter uh, unit 5 on fiber evidence so if we look at the bottom of our slide we see the weave is made by interlacing a lengthwise yarn which we call a warp with a horizontal yarn which is called a weft and we'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide all right, so following up our discussion of warp and weft, uh, we see on the left that fibers, and notice that's the British spelling, uh, we in the United States tend to do the R after the E, uh, but they're the raw materials. Uh, they're spun or twisted together to make yarns. Then we see the yarns are interlaced uh, to make fabrics. And so we see the fabrics that are made from yarns. Uh, there are different fabric patterns. We'll talk about a few of them. Again, don't worry so much about the specifics unless you happen to enjoy uh, knitting or crocheting or you have a, an active hobby that involves the fibers. We're mainly just looking at them as an overview uh, if you look over on the right hand side you notice that the warps which run uh, vertically uh, are sometimes in front of and sometimes behind the weft uh, which runs horizontally in this image and uh, that's to allow for greater strength and so that allows the fabrics to be uh, fairly robust and uh, able to resist tears uh, with certain force again depending on the particular fiber uh, there may be very strong resistance to tears and we'll talk about uh, fabrics used for bulletproof vests kevlar vests as you've probably heard of uh, and uh, again you may also know about cotton or other natural fibers that uh, certainly are not bulletproof but they are fairly strong for what they're made from so let's go ahead and take a look at some different types of weaves now that we understand the basics of a weave and now here on this slide, we see some various types of weaves. Again, not anything that you will expect to be uh, tested on, but just for your information, a few types, hopefully a couple familiar types, maybe twill, the top middle there, uh, bottom left, the basket weave is a very popular type of weave. Uh, again, these can be done with uh, different materials. Here we're talking about fibers and fabrics, uh, but you may have seen these weaves done with other materials. And uh, again, it's just a matter of how the warp and the weft are brought together to give the different weave patterns uh, that we see here. Again, this is not a comprehensive list. There's lots of other patterns out there. Uh, just some examples that uh, would uh, give you an idea of the various ways that you could bring together that warp and weft to make a weave. Okay, so moving on to some natural fibers. Uh, a lot of these would be familiar to you, especially from the plant sources. So uh, the most common plant fiber is cotton, and cotton is a crop that has an interesting history here in the United States. Of course, the early days of cotton production were largely done by slaves, right? African slaves that were uh, forced to labor for uh, very little compensation, right? uh, maybe some place to live, some food. Uh, but um, the invention of the cotton gin by Eli Whitney, who was a northerner originally from Massachusetts, um, he went down south to uh, take a look at some job opportunities. He thought maybe he would be a tutor or something, and he ended up 
uh, helping out with uh, cotton production. He actually worked at the widow of Nathaniel Green, if you know Green, New York, for instance, or a number of other places named after Nathaniel Green. But um, he uh, realized the problem with cotton uh, was those seeds, right? The short cotton that grew well uh, outside of the coastal regions had lots of little seeds and it required lots of labor. It took about a day for a single person to pick seeds from one pound of cotton. Uh, his machine uh, was able to get that same person to uh, go through 50 pounds of cotton in a day. Um, unfortunately, that didn't end slavery. Uh, it actually uh, increased the dependence on slaves because now the cotton croppers decided that they could get more bang for their buck if they just went ahead and uh, got more slaves to uh, plant more crop and uh, remove more seeds. And unfortunately, uh, not, I think, what uh, the, the um, Eli Whitney had in mind with his invention of the cotton gin. He also didn't make much money off it. There were a lot of pirates uh, who copied his invention. And uh, so it's uh, an unfortunate uh, tale in the unfortunate history of cotton. Um, cotton actually, uh, back to forensics, <laughs> appears ribbon-like under the microscope. Uh, lots of other natural plant fibers, flax, um, you'll also notice hemp there, right, uh, which isn't technically uh, the same plant that makes uh, marijuana, but it did go along with the uh, ban on uh, marijuana uh, at the federal level, helped to uh, have a negative impact on hemp. Uh, and um, now hemp is coming back just as marijuana is coming back in a number of states. If we switch over to the animal end of things, uh, we see the most common animal fiber is wool from sheep. So uh, wool is a nice warm uh, fiber and it's it's very commonly used in uh, regions that get cold in the winter time. Uh, a wool uh, sweater is a, a must have for uh, those cold uh, winter nights. So uh, if we look, there's a lot of other animals, uh, camel, llama, alpaca, goat, mink, uh, rabbit, uh, mink and rabbit, if you remember, had those interesting hairs from our last unit. Um, if we uh, skip ahead to silkworms, of course, silkworms are um, from uh, China. Uh, and so the silk trade was an important part of uh, the early uh, trade route from the Western world to the Far East. Uh, and it's a very labor intensive method of uh, boiling those silk cocoons and reclaiming the silk after you've discarded the dead worms. Um, you can get silk moths, uh, but that's not part of the plan. Usually if you're there to harvest silk, you don't wait for the moth to emerge. You go ahead and boil up that uh, worm that's gone into its uh, cocoon. So um, the modern day methods for making silk have come a long way. Uh, it's still in the early days of it, but there's actually another animal on our list that can be used currently to make silk, and that is the goat. Uh, transgenic uh, goats, goats that have had the silkworm DNA inserted into their genome, uh, produce silk in their milk. And um, it's, uh, again, a lot more silk than you would get out of a single silkworm, uh, but uh, it's not to the point where we have enough of these goats yet to have uh, big, huge silk farms, but it is an interesting proof of the concept of being able to insert that gene into other animals. And um, again, it's, it's happening now, along with that milk that the goat produces, there's silk in there, and uh, it certainly uh, has the promise for making silk even more affordable uh, than it currently is. All right, so if you don't like the idea of biochemists and molecular biologists tinkering around with goats and silkworms, well, the chemists have been uh, messing around with nature for quite some time with respect to fibers. Um, and so the man-made fibers, as you can see, are over half of all fabrics. So uh, we tend to classify them either as synthetic or manufactured fibers. Uh, and within the manufactured, we talk about regenerated. So those are made from natural fibers that have been chemically modified. So acetates and rayons, for instance, are made from dissolved cotton. So you take that natural fiber, the cotton fiber, uh, which isn't particularly soft and silky, um, but it's, it's a nice fiber. I don't want to get down on cotton. But uh, rayon, uh, by chemically treating the cotton to uh, modify it, you can get rayons, which are much silkier. And so it's uh, an improvement over the cotton if that's what you're looking for. Um, if we move to our next uh, material there, nylon, 
Uh, nylon's totally synthetic, so it's not a regenerated or manufactured fiber. It's a totally synthetic fiber. Nothing like it existed in nature before the chemists made it. Uh, and it's particularly stretchy, right? Nylons used to be the name for stockings, and uh, they were all the rage back when they were first coming out. So uh, nylon's got another application, if we have any daredevils out there. Uh, nylon's very important for parachute cords, right? You have to have something very stretchy that won't break, and not too many fibers meet that need. So nylon fills a a uh, nice place there for either the uh, people who choose to um, take on that activity, sky uh, diving, or uh, any of us who might find ourselves in the emergency situation of needing to use a parachute, we can thank Nylon for hopefully getting us down to Earth safely. Uh, polyester, again, that's another synthetic fiber. Um, acrylics, olefins, uh, and if we look down at the last one, aramid, or probably as you know it better, Kevlar, uh, is a fiber that not uh, only could it theoretically be found at a crime scene, but it's also likely to be used by law enforcement for bulletproof vests. So let's go ahead and finish uh, the next slide looking at that same idea. All right, so as promised, here we are looking further into aramid or Kevlar as a concealable vest material. Uh, if you look at the uh, far left, you see that the weave of that Kevlar uh, is very, very tight and very, very strong. So it can withstand uh, a bullet there. Uh, again, depending on how thick the Kevlar vest is, it can withstand uh, up to a pretty impressive bullet. It's not uh, infinitely bulletproof, right? If you have a really high powered rifle, it's likely to be able to penetrate even the um, level three Kevlar vest that we see over at, at the right hand side. Um, but again, uh, the various levels that we have, uh, there's level one, level 2A, level two, level 3A, and now level three with the dragon skin uh, as it's uh, commercially known, uh, the level three Kevlar material. Um, but uh, it has some drawbacks, right? You have to be shot in an area that you're covering. So if you are uh, not covering your head, uh, then that does still leave you vulnerable, right? Um, usually it's good for the chest. That's what we see in our slide here is a lot of uh, chest coverage there for uh, the um, various types of concealable vests. The um, uh, sales in these commercial units tend to spike around mass shootings, which unfortunately we have had our share in the United States. Um, and um, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot of parents will buy them for their children to make them uh, feel safer about sending their kids to school. Uh, hopefully it's all unnecessary, but as we see, uh, unfortunately, too often in the news, it, it uh, does impact us and we never quite know when there'll be another school shooting or mass shooting out in public. So uh, they're quite expensive, uh, but uh, perhaps it's worth it for the peace of mind they might provide. So now let's transition to talking about collection of fibers. So the more unique the fiber, the higher its value is to the crime scene because the uh, smaller that group when we talk about the class uh, evidence, class characteristic evidence, again, it's belonging to a larger group, but if it's a unique fiber, it may be a fairly small larger group, not usually individualized, but the smaller that class is to which it belongs, the more like individualized evidence it becomes. So fibers are important, even though, as we just said, they're not generally uh, individualizable, they're still quite important, and therefore you should collect them if you can find them. So how do you find them? Well, you look everywhere because we may be talking about very small amounts of fiber. So you need to look all around the scene. Uh, in particular, you should look at the victim's hands, feet, mouth, uh, in in, in um, looking at hands, feet, and mouth, what, what you might think of is why those locations? Well, depending on what's been done to the victim, uh, perhaps his or her hand and or feet have been bound by rope. Uh, their mouth may have had it some sort of gag in there. Uh, those are likely fabrics that were used, right? So the rope or the gag uh, may have left behind fibers. Um, the clothing of the victim, uh, the clothing of the suspect, right? The, the, there may have been a transfer of fibers. So check the clothing of both. Um, if you have any uh, of the uh, suspect's clothing left behind or check the victim's clothing to see if there have been fibers transferred from the suspect's clothing uh, to that victim at the scene. So 
again, just some basic ideas, but uh, it is trace evidence typically, uh, unless we're dealing with a large item that's left behind. But uh, in general, uh, the uh, perpetrators tend to clean up after themselves fairly well. So it's going to be most likely that you're looking for the uh, small trace fibers at a crime scene. Now, thinking about how small that trace evidence might be, the collection of fibers can become a tricky uh, topic. So uh, if we're looking for loose fibers, you can collect those with clean forceps. You want to avoid your bare hands, even your gloved hands. Uh, you may be more likely to uh, tear uh, or break those fibers than if you grasp them firmly with our forceps, right? Our scientific name for the tweezers that are typically used for a collection of trace evidence. You can also use lift tape uh, or vacuum sweepings. So if you uh, expect to find fibers uh, or um, you know that you have fibers that can easily be removed cleanly with forceps, uh, you could use uh, this special lift tape like we see there. Uh, or um, we could uh, look at the specialized vacuum. The vacuum has to be very, very clean uh, so that we don't have residue from a prior use. That whole vacuum bag gets sent to the lab so that anything uh, swept up at that scene is then analyzed by the crime lab technicians. Uh, the packaging of uh, fiber evidence, generally, again, unless the fiber is dripping with body fluids, uh, we can package it in folded paper and then place it in an envelope. Uh, we don't have to worry so much about paper versus plastic unless, like I said, there are uh, notable amounts of body fluid present on it, a bloodstained shirt, for instance. If uh, you are talking about clothing, it should be packaged separately. Uh, back when we looked at the O.J. Simpson case, uh, right, I think it was Ron Goldman's hat was placed in with uh, Nicole Brown Simpson's uh, shirt, um, even if it was with his own shirt. That's, uh, again, uh, an improper packaging. Uh, items should be separate. Even if it's his shirt and his hat, they should be in separate packaging. Finally, the one thing that sometimes is uh, overlooked by law enforcement in particular, um, you know, police officers who aren't used to processing crime scenes uh, would be to collect comparison samples. So if we have a bloodstained portion of the carpet, uh, we definitely know to collect that, but you should also collect an area away from the stain uh, as a comparison sample just to show what the fabric, the fibers look like in that area away from the uh, body fluid uh, infiltration. So. Uh, again, uh, it's trace evidence. There's lots to it, but uh, that's why uh, officers carry around that little FBI handbook so that they know how to collect the different types of physical evidence. So once those fibers have been collected and sent to the lab, the next task becomes identifying the fibers. So they are typically identified by lengthwise striations, uh, as we see over on the right hand uh, linen, uh, which comes from the flax plant, uh, tends to be a much um, smoother, straighter fat fiber than cotton from the cotton plant where it's a twisted fiber. So uh, just visually inspecting them and looking for striations in that lengthwise direction can uh, be very informative. Another feature that's uh, often used, birefringence. Uh, so this is a uh, notable feature when we have two different indices of refraction, uh, and uh, that will sometimes happen with our fibers. Um, so if you uh, are going to examine uh, for birefringence, you need a polarized light microscope, and we'll look at that uh, in uh, a little bit. Um, there's also the presence of delustering particles, which are titanium dioxide granules that help to reduce shine. Um, so you'll see those on various fibers, in particular the synthetic fibers we talked about. Nylon, for instance, has very high amounts of delustering particles, so that can be helpful in identifying those fibers. Uh, and finally, the cross sections of the fibers may give uh, particular information about the type of fiber that you're likely to be dealing with based on the cross section that you observe. As a follow-up to that uh, section of the previous slide about delustering particles, here we see uh, some images of fibers with delustering particles. Uh, so again, the titanium dioxide granules are generally uh, white in appearance, but because they block the light here in the uh, light microscope, they appear as those dark spots that you see on these uh, fibers. So 
the uh, fibers here have uh, reasonably high amounts and uh, that might lead us to believe based on what we just said that uh, we might be dealing with nylon fibers so again uh, just the presence or absence of delustering particles can be helpful information in analyzing fibers in this slide here we see the various fiber cross sections for a number of different uh, fibers uh, again you don't have to memorize all of these um, silk in particular has that triangular rounded edge pattern that we see there that one might be worth knowing uh, but uh, the others uh, I, I wouldn't expect that you know them all offhand especially since we see a couple of different varieties right if you look at the bottom right uh, there's both regular rayon which has those square uh, with voids uh, type cross sections uh, and then there's the Avril which is a trademarked uh, commercial uh, type of rayon and that has a star uh, or a concertina a, a pattern there cross section so even with the same sort of fiber we see some different uh, cross sections so acetate again you see at the bottom left and the top right those are different uh, acetate patterns so um, aside from silk which has the triangular rounded edges that uh, seem to be characteristic of uh, silk fibers uh, I wouldn't expect you to uh, know any of these but if you want to take a moment to look at them they are uh, interesting patterns for the various types of cross-section uh, and this is just a small list of the uh, potentially um, uh, large number of fiber cross sections that you might see so uh, there we have it and if you're interested you can go to the website there on the screen and see if you want to spot any more patterns for a more elaborate uh, and uh, less popular fibers now we see our technician examining some fiber evidence under the microscope uh, there's lots of different methods for examining fiber evidence some will destroy the fiber like a flame test where we actually burn the fiber to see what uh, the flame looks like and that can be uh, indicative of the various elements involved um, we also have a couple of types of chromatography uh, plain old paper chromatography you may have done something like this uh, back in elementary or middle or even high school with uh, coffee filter paper and um, maybe some permanent markers or something like that where you separate the different colors uh, you can use that sort of approach uh, much more common is pyrolysis gas chromatography we'll talk a little bit about that uh, further on uh, and then there's the various types of microscopes so um, it looks like our technician there might be using a stereo microscope I think I see two eyepieces there uh, and just a single scope system um, there's the traditional compound light microscope there's the comparison light microscope that involves two compound light microscopes the stereoscope that I mentioned I believe is the one uh, she's using in our picture polarizing light microscope um, multi uh, microspectrophotometer uh, and infrared spectroscopy so we'll talk about these methods in the upcoming slides okay so looking at our flame tests for the fiber we have to consider does the fiber ignite uh, does it burst into flames uh, is what we mean by igniting does it melt uh, does it simply curl before even touching the flame uh, all of these different uh, flame test results can help identify the fiber that we might be dealing with they also tend to destroy the fiber especially if the fiber ignites right then we don't have that fiber anymore uh, other things that you might see does it flare does it shrink does it sizzle while in the flame uh, what odor arises as you burn that fiber uh, does it self-extinguish or uh, do you have to wait until uh, the entire uh, fiber is consumed uh, what residue is left do you get a fluffy ash uh, is there a hard bead is there a bead that then turns into ash uh, again at our level we're not necessarily going to uh, interpret all these results but just uh, be aware that these are different types of questions we should be asking as we're performing our flame tests on fiber evidence and now uh, is a refresher for paper chromatography uh, hopefully if you don't remember the phrase hopefully these images might jog your memory if you were able to explore this at some point in your uh, educational career uh, chromatography of any type uh, literally means color writing so it relies on a stationary phase a phase that does not move in this case the paper 
uh, and a mobile phase, which is the phase that carries the compounds in the mixture through that stationary phase. So in this case, the mobile phase would be uh, either water, if we're dealing with water-soluble uh, markers, or uh, alcohol, rubbing alcohol, if we're dealing with the so-called permanent markers that uh, water wouldn't do much to. Uh, and again, uh, based on the pattern that we see at the end, uh, if we look at the uh, leftmost um, image there, uh, on the right hand side of the screen we see that the blue uh, is sort of the last um, to separate it's it's gone the furthest up that line uh, we have the red magenta color that separated beforehand um, in the middle it's still the blue at the top but there's more of a yellow color in between uh, that has come off first uh, and then at the end they've both gone up quite a ways but it looks like the yellowish pigment separated uh, onto the chromatography paper just before the reddish pigment did. So the further along the pigments are carried, the more they like the mobile phase compared to the stationary phase. So if they separate out faster, it's because they have a high affinity for the paper relative to the uh, water, alcohol, whatever that liquid is in this example. Uh, if they hang out in uh, that uh, liquid mobile phase longer, then uh, they um, must have a greater affinity for that than for the stationary phase. So uh, again, hopefully something that you got to play with. If you never got to and you uh, want to have a little experiment at home, uh, just get yourself a water-soluble uh, marker, um, some uh, coffee filters that you cut into strips, and then um, a glass with water like we see there, and uh, make sure that your line that you draw with your water-soluble markers at least uh, a little above that water level and so that when you put it in it doesn't just uh, dissolve into the water but rather the water gets drawn up through the coffee filter and you get a chance to see the separation. Uh, so a black um, water soluble marker should have a number of different colored pigments that you should see at the end. So if you take that challenge and you want to share with me uh, an image of your um, setup and results I'd love to see that please do send it along. Now moving on to pyrolysis gas chromatography. This is not a do-yourself-at-home type challenge, right? Uh, this is an instrument that is going to set you back quite a, a few. Uh, so uh, this is best done in the lab setting. Uh, the fibers put into the unit. Uh, it's heated until it decomposes into gases. So it's um, not done in an oxygen environment where the fiber might burn in oxygen, but rather uh, in an inert gas, uh, something like nitrogen or helium or something that's not going to react with it so that you get just the decomposition upon heating. Uh, the GC separates and then based on the uh, peak pattern or if you wanted to couple it to uh, mass spectrometry uh, to really identify beyond any doubt what the gases are, that will help you to identify what the fiber was that you started with. So uh, again, a, a nice method. Unfortunately, it does destroy the sample but it doesn't require large amounts of samples. So as long as you've got a little fiber to spare, pyrolysis gas chromatography is a great method for getting you information about the specifics of uh, what that fiber uh, is made from. Now we saw on the uh, slide a few slides back that there are a number of different microscopic methods that can be used to analyze fibers. So we're going to talk a little bit about microscopes here because they are important in a variety of forensic applications. Uh, they're important in hair, which was our previous unit. They're important here in fibers. Uh, we'll talk about them again when we get to soil. So there's a lot of different places that microscopes are handy for the forensic scientists. Uh, and even the compound microscopes, right? The relatively less expensive uh, variety that you probably got to explore back in middle school or high school. Um, those microscopes are, uh, again, still valuable, even though they're not especially expensive uh, and they don't tell you elemental analysis or things that uh, the more expensive microscopes might be able to identify for you. Uh, they're still valuable, they're still useful, uh, and um, hopefully you've had some experience with them, uh, if nothing less than you had the experience in the online lab. So let's take a look at microscopes. Here we see an image of the classic compound light microscope, and uh, again, even though it's been around for quite a while, it's relatively inexpensive, it's still 
uh, the most commonly used microscope in the crime lab and uh, one of the most important uh, of all instruments used in forensics. So uh, the key features, again, we had the eyepiece or ocular uh, as it's also known, and that's generally a 10x uh, ocular uh, magnification. Then down at the nose piece, we have the objective lenses that you can generally uh, choose between uh, 5 or 4, depending, uh, times magnification, then 10x, and finally 40x. And if you have an oil immersion setup, maybe a 100x down there. Don't forget to multiply the 10x ocular by whatever you've selected for the objective lens by moving that nose piece, uh, and you'll get the overall magnification which is what we're really looking for. Uh, we have over on the left, the coarse focus and the fine focus at lower mag. The coarse focus is uh, fine for using, the fine focus just for getting that um, crisp uh, focus sample. At higher magnification, it should only be the fine focus that you're using anyway, because you don't wanna run the risk of damaging that objective lens by bringing the sample uh, too close to the lens itself. Uh, we have our stage there where the sample sits. Uh, there's the iris diaphragm that will allow for uh, differing amounts of light. Um, the illuminator, so it's a compound light microscope, so we're using uh, visible light here to image a sample. So uh, there we have it. The arm and the base are how you carry the microscope so that you don't damage it. And I think we've covered the key features there of the compound light microscope. So looking into a little more detail of those key ones that I tried to point out on the previous slide, uh, we see the eyepiece or ocular as it's also known, contains that ocular lens. It generally has a magnification of 10X. Uh, there's, again, it's possible that there's other magnifications out there, uh, but generally speaking, it's that 10X, uh, the 10 times magnification that you're likely to find in your uh, ocular lens. Uh, you can confirm that, you can take a look. Uh, just as we see in that middle image uh, where we have the 10x there as the middle um, set of uh, numbers and letters in that um, IP specification area, uh, that's where we would see that. So it's somewhere on that eyepiece, uh, the ocular is going to be uh, an indication of its magnification, and most of the times it's going to be a 10x magnification. Now the objective lens, uh, we generally have a few objective lenses to uh, select from. Um, you start with the lowest magnification and focus because that's going to give you the largest uh, field of view. So you're going to have the easiest time finding the sample, centering the sample, and then moving up to higher magnification. If you try to uh, just um, start at the highest magnification, then you're going to have a tougher time than you imagine finding that sample. So it's just much better lab practice to find the sample under the lowest mag, get it in the center of the field of view, and then increase to the next highest magnification, check to make sure it's still in the field of view, and then finally move on to the highest magnification and do the same thing with respect to focusing. So uh, we're really uh, looking to um, focus uh, the sample at lower mag and then move up if you need more information you can go to a higher magnification once you're at that highest magnification uh, you do not want to focus that sample with the coarse focus or the lens may crack so you want to use the fine focus only uh, because it will not at least it should not as a safety feature in most scopes it should not allow you to um, bring the uh, sample too close to that um, highest magnification objective lens. To find the total magnification, which is generally what we're interested in, we need to multiply that ocular lens, which is generally our 10x, by the objective lens. So in this image, if we're looking at this scope as it's set, it's the 4x objective, the 10x ocular, so 10x times 4x gives us 40x total. If we look at the other options here, there's a 10x uh, objective along with the 10x ocular would give 100 times total magnification. And finally, for this example, we have just the 40x as the highest magnification. So 40x and 10x uh, uh, from the ocular gives us a total of 400 times 
for the highest mag. So 40 times for the lowest mag, 400 times for the highest. And again, it's important that you specify total magnification because if you just tell me 40X, I don't know if that's because you have the 10X ocular and the 4X objective, or are you just saying 40X for that 40X objective lens, forgetting about the 10X ocular. So that's why we always want to specify, and generally what we specify is the total magnification of our image. As an improvement to the compound light microscope, the comparison microscope is two compound light microscopes right next to each other where uh, you look through a binocular type array up there where one eye, let's say the left eye here, is looking at the left scope while the right eye is looking at the right scope. So uh, the benefit here is the left eye sees that left image and the right eye sees that right image at the same time. Uh, and you're able to manipulate those samples. So if you have a fiber found at the scene, you might have that on the left side, uh, for instance, uh, and then you have a fiber that you recovered from a suspect and you might have that in the right scope and uh, you can align them and see uh, if you have a match, if you have a um, fiber in the uh, known uh, scene fiber that matches that's consistent with the fiber uh, that was found on the suspect so uh, again it's still class evidence but uh, the more uh, examples of class evidence that you can find uh, the uh, more and more probable it becomes that the suspect of interest is the person who actually committed the crime so uh, that's what we're looking at here and it's used uh, again in fibers can be used in hair it can be used in a bullet comparison so it's a very very versatile and valuable technique and uh, it's just the matter of combining two simple uh, compound mi light microscopes but it's a very powerful method and it's a very visual method that uh, the results can be presented to the jury and the jury can understand what they see without a whole lot of scientific background Moving on to the stereo microscope, this is a different type of microscope. This type, as you see, it's not the compound light microscope. You don't have to have an illumination source below that moves through the sample. Instead, generally, you have uh, some sort of light source up above uh, that shines down and reflects light into the um, lens system here. Uh, and so you can't get as high a magnification, but you do have a much better depth of field. You can have larger samples, for instance. You can have samples that don't require uh, the light to pass through so they can be um, opaque or solid objects that you would not be able to use in the traditional compound light microscope. They would work fine on the stereo microscope. Uh, stereo microscope is also known as a dissecting scope. It allows for fine dissection, so you may have used that in a biology lab at some point. Um, but the uh, most common use in forensics is to use to screen objects for trace evidence. So uh, to look at an object that with the naked eye you, you may not notice um, you know, small things, uh, but uh, under the microscope it might uh, draw out that you have hair or blood or fibers attached to that trace evidence uh, that attached to that uh, original objects rather that uh, may be too small of trace evidence to notice or um, to um, be able to remove without the aid of the stereoscope. It gives that three-dimensional view because you are using both eyes at once, whereas with the compound light microscope, even if you're using the comparison microscope, it's still one eye for each object, so it's not going to give you uh, much depth. So you're not going to get the three-dimensional view like you do under the stereoscope. That's why we call it stereo, right, because you get uh, both eyes involved. Um, the drawback is it tends to have a pretty low magnification, but believe it or not, it tends to be enough to uh, get what you need from it. So, um, you know, just having that uh, maybe 50 times magnification uh, can really uh, make the object look much different and uh, draw out those pieces of trace evidence that might otherwise have been overlooked or couldn't be removed effect efficiently without the aid of the stereoscope. We mentioned birefringence earlier in the lecture, and I mentioned that we would get to it when we talked about the polarized light microscope, and here it is. So polarized light microscopy uses plain polarized light to determine uh, features like birefringence. So if you've ever owned a pair of polarized sunglasses, 
you may have noticed that uh, they sort of make you like a superhero a little bit, right? Uh, especially um, if you've worn them uh, by the water, if you've worn them either for fishing or you're at the beach um, and you've looked in the water, uh, you probably have noticed that you get a much better um, view of what's down in that water with polarized uh, lenses than with plain old traditional um, lenses for uh, non-polarized sunglasses so it's that same sort of idea just like the sunglasses where you may have already explored that phenomenon here we're using it in the microscope uh, to get the plain polarized light that can show us uh, that uh, key feature at least for fibers of birefringence so if we look at the uh, nylon fiber uh, when we examine it under uh, plain polarized light uh, then you can see it has a very different appearance and uh, that birefringence can be useful in identifying nylon quickly and, and without destroying it. We don't have to use uh, pyrolysis gas chromatography, for instance, if we can get the information we need out of the polarized light microscope, which is a non-destructive method. If what we're really looking for runs um, more than what the traditional microscope can do, uh, then we can uh, use a combo instrument like the microspectrophotometer. So in this instance, we have a compound microscope attached to a spectrophotometer, uh, which is an instrument that analyzes light from a specimen, generally um, near IR, near UV, but mostly visible light. Uh, and so it can analyze the dyes in the fibers. So you uh, can go ahead and use that compound microscope to get the region of the fiber of interest. Uh, and then uh, if that's what's focused in the uh, compound microscope, then that's what's being analyzed in the spectrophotometer. Uh, and it really analyzes the dyes in the fibers, right? So those dyes tend to be visible colors. And so you tend to get the absorbance spectrum uh, for those uh, where they absorb light. So the absorption spectra uh, for the example we see here shows direct blue 71, direct red 81, direct yellow 27. So uh, you get those different uh, absorbances at the specific wavelengths that relate to those particular dyes. And so uh, it's uh, very helpful for analyzing the dye profile of a fabric and um, allowing you to compare that dye profile of say the fabric at the scene with uh, fabric found at a suspect's residence for instance. And to end our unit we'll look at infrared spectroscopy which is another spectroscopic method uh, sort of like the, uh, the spectrophotometry we just talked about. In this case uh, infrared spectroscopy is looking at the infrared region so uh, the heat region of our electromagnetic spectrum. And again, we identify that with heat because it's enough to make molecules vibrate, but it isn't uh, strong enough to um, break down most molecules. So uh, you get the bond stretches, the bond vibrations, uh, characteristic regions in the infrared spectrum, uh, and where those uh, readouts are, as we see here with polyester and polyamides, uh, we get an idea of the bond stretches that are characteristic to those materials. So polyesters are going to have carbonyl stretches uh, and then carbon oxygen stretches, uh, whereas the polyamides are going to have some carbon nitrogen stretches that are going to be uh, at slightly different wave numbers, the inverse um, centimeters there along the bottom uh, are going to differ for those different types of materials. So uh, that's another non-destructive method, uh, right? It's unlike the um, burning it up uh, or at least um, causing it to outgas with the gas chromatography, the um, pyrolysis GC that we talked about. Here we're just looking at how uh, the sample uh, interacts with infrared light, uh, which is again a much uh, milder approach and it gives rise to uh, bond uh, vibrations that don't destroy the molecules. And so you can recover your sample here, uh, whereas from pyrolysis GC, your sample has been uh, pyrolyzed and is no longer uh, recoverable. So uh, there we have it, uh, the key features of uh, the um, forensic applications of uh, fibers and the different methods that we can use to analyze the fibers after we've collected those fibers and identified those fibers at a crime scene. So uh, thank you again for uh, bearing with us through this unit and look forward to working with you for our next unit. Take care, everybody.